hearing scheduled for 7 p.m. Request by Alex Keeslin, Diane Walter, Marjorie Hess, Rudy Calabar for special permit for minor expansion less than 30 feet in height and central business architectural review for admission at 70 and 76 Masonic Street with Hampton Map ID 31B 123 as advertised uh, March 29th and April 5th, 2012. Uh, this is a joint hearing for central business architecture. And I don't see Bruce. Bruce isn't here. I think I'm the vice chair, so I'll officially open our hearing. Okay. Um, so typically when we have these joint hearings, um, we're going to hear from the applicant, hear from the public. Um, each board can choose to vote tonight. You all can vote tonight. We can vote tonight. Uh, each board can decide independently whether to close their public hearing, uh, if they feel they've heard everything, or they can leave it open if they continue the hearing to a later date. Um, I'm not sure if you all decided if you're going to try to vote tonight or if you're going to carry this on to the next meeting. Uh, we haven't met to decide anything. Okay. So we'll just have those tonight. <coughs> um, all right. So the first thing is from who's going to speak for the applicant? Well, I can do that. I'm, uh, my name is Alex Gieslin. Uh, I live at 164 Riverside Drive in Bay State Village. And I'm here to, um, and good evening, members of the Joint Committee. I'm here to uh, ask for a special permit to build a small addition, well, a two-story addition, to a building we own at 7076 Masonic Street. That's a uh, governed and owned by a condominium association, Ansel Wright. Um, Marjorie Hess and Rudy Talabar are, and Diane Welter and myself own all the units. Um, I, I don't... Uh, the, our case for not building a 30, uh, a, a, a building that's 30 feet high is that no part of the building uh, is 30 feet at this point. It doesn't uh, make economic sense or, I think, uh, architectural sense to try and, and build uh, such a big structure. It's not space we need or can afford. So I'm here uh, to answer any kind of questions you have. Uh, you have all the um, the elevations, shows you the facades, what we're going to do. Um, the intent is to finish the building exactly the way the existing building is. Same color, same clabbered, same double hung windows um, to make it uh, same <coughs> trim, to make it look um, as identical as possible. I should point out that this building that we have done our part to lift this building. It's 10 feet higher than it was 15 years ago. We jacked the whole building up when we renovated it and put a, a third floor, put a new first floor and made it a three-story building. But you jack it up 10 more feet to make it a <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we could do that anymore. But yeah. The neighborhood has changed. Um, Anything else, or should we just ask, open up for questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll open up for questions from the boards. Uh, anybody have any questions for the applicant? <coughs> One of the questions, I, uh, I know there's the path between the State Street parking lot uh, that goes in front of that building, and this yeah. is not going to close off or block that, that path. No. No, we're going to keep that path, probably move it uh, a little bit. Okay. But yes. It's a crucial, crucial yeah. concept. Right. My goodness, nothing? Okay, um, so I, I have a question. Is there anybody in the public? Well, we'll do that. What it looks like? Is, that, is, that? is there anybody that wants to see what it looks like? Well, I think what the applicant is saying is that the, the, the finish, the exterior trim, the windows, and everything is going to look exactly like the current building. We've included. Not exactly what I'm doing. What would you like to have? Well, I'm. Anybody in the audience hasn't seen this, that's what I, that's my whole point. Is, is anybody want to see this? Oh, well, we'll, we'll ask you for public comment in just one okay. second. Do you have any questions? Um, okay. Uh, can I ask what the uh, purpose of the addition is? The, um, they're both expansions of the existing uses. Downstairs from the expansion of that uh, office space. And upstairs is going to be an expansion of the residential uh, condominium. So, 
you don't expect it to have any effect on parking? No. The number of people. So it's an expansion of the existing unit? Yes. Yeah, if there's no other questions from the board, we'll ask if uh, anyone from the public would like to do anything. All right, I'll have a seat. We'll see if anybody from the public here to speak about this issue. Is there anybody from the public who'd like to comment on this? Come on up to the podium, state your name and address, and I'll ask you to sit. Hi. Hey. Uh, <coughs> my name is uh, Bill Arnold. Um, I'm here representing two of the tenants who actually live at 35 State Street, uh, Residence A and Residence B. They're both working. One is a nurse and one is a musician. They can't make it, so they asked me to come. Uh, I am have a business at uh, Northampton Airport, and they're concerned about the distance being five feet from specifically apartment D and the two foot or the, the ten foot tower that's built in front of this tenant's door. So basically, uh, it's Dolores Bayer. She'll be, when this, if this building is constructed, she'll be looking at a brick wall that's I think they're doing the wrong project. Right, you're, you're talking about the project we're doing next. The, the two That's the signs, people on right. Where's ours? Is not. I know what you're talking about. It's not ours. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. This, that my mistake. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's okay. my mistake. <laughs> I'll just step right up. Forget, right. I, forget I was even here on that one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, no, we got like 15 Don't minutes. Go oh, okay. Uh, anyone else in the public here to speak to this issue? So the, the only issue, the only reason I believe this is coming before us is because it's not 30 feet. Right. If, if this and building, yeah. if this addition was proposed outside of central business, we wouldn't see it because it, it wouldn't apply. The only, the only reason we're seeing, at least the planning board thought, the only reason we're seeing it is because it's less than 30 feet in central business. Right. So, um, so unless any members of the uh, central business have any questions, I move we close our public hearing. I second. All in favor? Great. So the public hearing is closed, so we can't take any more uh, comments from the audience. Um, any discussion on the planning board side? I think it's um, the 30 foot requirement in this case would be kind of ridiculous. Right. It's in keeping with the building. I agree. Okay, I think in the context of the addition of what it's trying to do and what the ordinance was intended. Say it anywhere in that um, the clever school match, or was it, was it just verbal? It was it's verbal. In the it's in the application. Yeah. Okay. Then I, I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we can uh, quickly handle our 
Yeah. So, the everybody has the, the minutes from March 12th to approve, March 22nd, and March to, to three sets of minutes to approve. Does anybody have any comments on the minutes from those three meetings? So it all Yes. <laughs> Scheduled for 7 p.m. 7 15 p.m. Request by Thomas Douglas for special permit for addition less than 30 feet in height. Uh, in Central Business Architectural Review for an addition at 60 Masonic Street, Canton Map ID 31D-122 31D-252. That's published March 29th and April 5th. Um, Randy is a butter, so Randy has recused himself from this hearing. Um, that means Andrew, you're be voting for Brandy. So, the applicant. Hi, I'm Tom Douglas. I'm the architect for this project. Um, Seth Jolly is the um, owner of it. And he owns that house there, which is behind the fireplace. I mean, the fire station, <laughs> the old fire station. <laughs> Sorry, I was working on the design 10 minutes ago. So. Um, so we built this house about 10 years ago on top of the old brick uh, alarm building of the fire station. It's a three-story building. Um, you can see that the building behind it, the old fly-by-night building, was almost finished when this picture was taken. And you can see kind of the relative height difference. Uh, the fly-by-night building with that Typar wrap on it comes up to about the middle of the third floor windows. Uh, and so I, I couldn't measure what the height of that building was, but it's, it's pertinent a little bit later on. I think it's about 30 feet, and that building is taller than 30 feet. So there's the context with the, the new house behind it. It um, has a stucco uh, facade to it with metal trim, and uh, the green part is, is uh, shingles. And it's uh, the Apollo windows, or the wood-clad window with, real, with uh, simulated divided lights. And that's the picture from further back, not as good a color. And that's the other side, and, and that part right there, you're looking down that <coughs> excuse me, alleyway to basically where the site is that we want to build. 
on. And if you see that tree at the end of that alleyway, there's a green space in front of those cars, between the cars and the tree. And our building will overhang that green space by about five or six feet. So you see those three cars down there at the end of that alleyway. You see that pickup truck, our building's going to come to about that, that point. And this is a better, closer shot of it. And you can see um, the red house to the right is the abutter. And then you can see further behind it, the fly-by-night building, the red brick building, that um, I think is about 30 feet, but I'm not sure. So this is the context, the aerial view of what we're proposing. And um, so it's got a tower on the corner which is uh, taller than 30 feet. It's evolved a little bit since I gave you drawings. Um, we were kind of under the gun to get this design into the planning board uh, to get on your docket, so we've been designing some since then, so it's evolved somewhat. So I'll just go back to the site plan now. So you can see the uh, red rectangle is the lot that we're proposing to carve out of the existing Media Education Foundation lot. So the Media Education Foundation bought the old fire station and they owned that entire lot and then Sut Jolly carved out the house to the left, the one that says existing. That house is actually now too big for him and he wants to downsize. So he's selling that house and he's going to build a house immediately adjacent to it. Um, so a smaller house, a two-story house rather than a three-story house. And, and it's actually not even two stories because the first floor is all parking. So we're going to preserve all the parking spaces that are there currently. We're going to build a house on top of it. And what you're seeing there on the first floor, since this is the first floor plan, is a storage area to the left with two doors open, a double door opening into it, and then a stair on the right that gets you up to the, um, the second floor. And then you can see shaded in between the red property boundaries and the existing house to the right, which was that red gabled house. You can see shaded in there is that green space that I was just talking about. And it's about 16 feet and change from the property line. The, the, uh, I guess I can go up here. This is the house. another maybe five, four or five feet between the house and here. And then the house you can see is angled. This this right here is a easement that um, we've been working to try to figure out what the legal, who actually owns it and where it came from. But it appears that this easement is a part of this lot and it was sold as a part of this lot when Media Education Foundation bought it. Um, it's hard to tell back in history where it came from, but it, it basically gives right of passage back to this house right here. So we're gonna build into that easement uh, over it, but we're gonna preserve the parking that's under it. So, um, and, and, and I know that there'll be some questions as to what uh, legal documents are required to build into that easement and, and uh, Seth Jolly can answer them or Seth's lawyer here because they've been drafting some uh, some documents regarding that. So this is what the house will look like from above. This is it from out in the street. So you're just going to see a sliver of it. The, fire, the fire, old fire station is to your left. And then this is... Uh, <coughs> the other side of the fire station, and you're going to barely be able to see anything uh, of that house from this, this view. And like I said, the materials are going to be the same, so you can see the existing house is on the left and the new proposed structure is on the right. We're going to use the same materials, uh, stucco for that lower section, uh, shingles, painted shingles for the other section, and then more modern, modern layout for uh, windows. And the height, uh, one, two, we're here for two things. One is for what it looks like, the aesthetics, and the other is for the height of it. And since I, I, I mentioned that it has evolved a little bit over time, the current height up to 
If you, you see the third floor windows, that's a little penthouse up there that gets you up to a roof deck. So the third floor windows have a little projecting roof above it. And that's the, that's the roof right there. So the piece above that is a parapet wall, which actually doesn't count towards the height in downtown. But if I can, the height from ground to that projecting piece of trim above the third floor windows is 32 foot two. So, but then the height to the lower stucco parapet wall, does everybody understand what the parts that I'm talking about? Okay. The stucco parapet wall, that's only 27 feet. So our entire building um, doesn't conform to the 30 foot minimum, but a portion of it exceeds the 30 foot minimum by two foot two inches. So I'm not sure if that changes whether you have any jurisdiction over this or not. I don't know, but um, my, the main thing that I'm trying to um, <coughs> say here is that we're constructing a building that is very similar to the neighboring building that we built before and is, is very, very similar in height <coughs> to the surrounding buildings. And, and that's why I go back to, um, to uh, let's see, these earlier pictures of what Fly by Night built uh, back there, you can kind of see. We're going to be about that height there with our, the new uh, parapet wall. So this building is being built far off the main street, set way back where people can't see it very much. And it's going to be conform in, in, um, in keeping with the surrounding heights of the, the neighboring buildings. Um, and then it's also going to be keeping in keeping with the new building that's adjacent to its site's building. So, so that's um, pretty much my presentation on the building. And I think that we should talk about the easement for a second. So I don't know if Sut or Dick, if you want to explain that. <laughs> um, so we're, um, well, the we apologize. Uh, sorry, what's about to say your name? And oh, <coughs> <coughs> um, I'm such Ali, I'm the proposed owner of the, the new building. Uh, we've been, the abutter is um, Ansel Wright from the Millions, uh, most of them are here. <laughs> and so we've been engaged in discussions uh, to try and figure out exactly what we're going to be doing on that. And we're very, we've got an agreement in principle, I don't think you may want to speak to that about, uh, about what we can do in that, in that space. Which is, we, we're going to, I think they're okay with us going over the five feet into, uh, into the passageway. Um, and that it doesn't interfere with the, the, the rights that pass and, and we pass to their building. Anything else in your presentation? Um, no, I can take questions. Um, so, uh, again, like the previous application, the reason we're seeing this one because the entire building is not a foot high. Well, again, these are new drawings, so what you can see in your plan is didn't come um, 30 feet at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's an average measurement, but I'm just going to double check and so we need to revise plans to show what the percentage of the <laughs> roof height is. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, it's just starting to do that actually. Yeah, and I don't know that percentage right on hand. I didn't, didn't think of that. I think the only thing they would um, really um, address would be determining whether or not the building had to be connected so that it's an addition to an existing building as opposed to a building on its own without right. the connection. We are connecting it. It's a little bit hard to see right there, but um, we're just connecting it with a little roof to cover parking space. So you can see it right there. So this is a parking space right here that goes to that hill. Um, and then it'll get roofed over covering there where we patch it. But we're still going to carve out a separate lot for um, this, this new structure. So I guess uh, the, the two questions then are what proportion of the roof has to be over 30 feet for it to be an issue for us? Right. And then 
what is the definition of a connector? Does it? Uh, oh. Anything that's attached. It can be. It's the building that already went through the building commissioner. Basically, they got here initially because it was a connection, and therefore it could be viewed as an addition. Mm -hmm. um, and then it could fall under the provision that allows for additions to existing structures being less than 30 feet. Um, and so that's where there would have to be a provision that it was actually connected and was technically an addition in order for it to continue forward. But once it's over 30 feet, or you know, it might be 50% of the roof, I don't know, I'm going to double check, then you wouldn't necessarily need that connector. So for the plan, in, the, the, in the planning board for side, if, if the per, enough of the percentage of this roof is over 30 feet, you wouldn't even have to come to board. Right. Right. So uh, I guess, it, can you figure that before we get yeah. okay, so we'll do is while Carol is looking at that, we can do other questions as well. Okay. Um, so well, I can tell you just from looking at that elevation, it's probably one third of the roof is above thirty feet. Okay. That's a good guesstimate, I think. Yeah, but if the buildings are connected, don't you count the other building also? I don't know. Hmm. Why don't we do? Carolyn's going to be looking it up. Why don't we do questions and let her let her look into that? No. I'm I'm confused by these. Then who owns the the property? Media Education Foundation owns the property, but there's an easement that goes through it. So they were negotiating a um, some type of something that allows SUT to go into that easement. Who are they negotiating with? The Condominium okay. Association. But I thought you said it's owned by Northampton Education Foundation. Media okay. Education Foundation. Don't they but, that, have but that pretty much is SUT Valley. Oh, sorry. It's his company. Okay. So. Okay. Sorry. So I, sorry, I didn't make that clear. Negotiations you have to do with the abutter on the other side. Okay. And so, as far as the deed goes, it seemed like the only person, the only property that had rights to that easement was the red house in the back. But they're um, okay. Ansel Adams. Ansel Matt. Yes. <laughs> no, Ansel Wright. Ansel Wright. Everything. Thank you. Right. <laughs> so that's the best the other day. Right? <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Um, so I think then, um, uh, I guess the Alex or if any of your group want to speak to this issue of the unit, it seems like there was uh, implied that you have all come to an agreement. Is there an agreement in place? There, there's not a. Uh, we don't have a written agreement. We have been uh, negotiating and throwing lines uh, on the pavement. I think that we've come. To, I think that we're in principle. I mean, we don't have a document. There's been no uh, assessment. I think it's fairly clear that we do have uh, an easement, a right of easement for that. Um, Ansel Wright sold that that lot to the city in 1870 for the fire station, and it's very clearly marked in the deeds uh, that the, of, of passage uh, right away there. Um, that being said, uh, you know, it's it's a big building. It's going to shade uh, our building. Um, we have mixed feelings, but uh, such a good neighbor. We're in agreement <coughs> with the principles of building up in the city of Infill. Uh, that's a tight little neighborhood back there. So uh, the, our principal concern really was access to the building. We need we have two, there are two parking places in there, and if you look at, at two the, parking spaces that go with your building? Yes. In that part, the interior parking, are two covered, two garages in our building. Oh, oh okay. And the easement is what provides access to the Provides garages. access, because actually, you know, if you can build to your property line, then, uh, then Kathy Borowski's old building could actually build, you see where our corner is. Uh, it's really crucial that we have that space. So just so those last two parking spots in the new design are for your <coughs> cars on we, your property. We're we'll, we're going to own that. Uh, at least that's my understanding. That such going to transfer ownership of the land that's from his property line to our property line down to right there. Right. So to that um, north. So you're saying this area is going to be transferred to you? Yes. Down, down to, to there, and then a, a line from that corner to our point to our tent 
to like hand about 16 feet there, 16 or 17 feet, which I, which I think is enough. This rectangular area right here. Yeah. Basically from your property line this way all the way up moving from yours. Right. Okay. And I assume we'll continue to have a right of passage across the remainder of that whole bit. This area here. Yeah, well, of course that area, right. Now, because we can, uh, I think the staff recommendation on this permit is that, uh, I'll, I'll read it out loud, so everybody hears it. Um, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant must show that resolution has been reached to construct in the right of way, either by amending the passageway easement agreement or by making legal representation by an attorney that he has the right to construct as shown. So I think there's two pieces to that. One is that you have to show that you have the legal right to build into that easement. And that the second part is that you have to show that you reached an agreement with the abutter. And that will be the condition on this permit. Um, does that seem like it covers both sides of it? Okay. Give it a second. Just so the two pieces were that uh, because the applicant has to prove that they have the ability to build on that easement, that was one. And two, that the applicant has reached an agreement with the abutter, that was the second part. Does that sound clear? Right. Okay. Um, there was also a recommendation here that the staff recommends that the board allow a smaller footprint with or without a corresponding height increase to enable a workable solution to the easement issue. So there's, a, there's another condition that staff is recommending to put in the permit. Well, I, mean, I don't there. think it's, I think that if they hadn't come to an agreement that from your perspective, I don't think it would hold for some okay. business architecture, but given that the issue up till today had been the height, I think that if you all felt comfortable with Questions from the board, either board. Um, is it possible to read the central business architecture criteria for review? Or <laughs> the, staff yeah. the staff recommendations. Yeah, yeah. That's for, for yeah. the sure. um, Yeah, I mean, they were basically the yeah. issue um, was similar to you all, except that in the context that if the design did change, I think you would want to see that. So, um, Tom, is this the final design? Yes. Um, <laughs> that was a quick yes. <laughs> no, it's just going to keep getting better. Um, <laughs> with time and age. Um, the, the change I made recently to this is I lowered the whole height of the tower by 10 inches, but that's so that, sorry. Well, I do think it's a nice development from what we saw initially to where it is now. There's yeah, architecturally, it's much much nicer, and I do like how both buildings relate to each other. I, I did have a question about what it looks like from State Street and whether that's part of our jurisdiction or not. Well, if it's visible from State Street, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think it probably would be through the, the parking yeah, lot. Yeah. I think you can see it down the end. I guess. That's the that's not right, right. I don't have a picture. I was just trying to see what was behind like it. Across the street well, well if you go to the site plan and see how much it projects in front of um, the property that you just reviewed, and you might be able to get a better sense of what it looks like. Yeah, see that fence back there where those cars are parked? I guess that's a clear shot at State Street right there. Our problem with. with oh, I was thinking Center Street, right? Oh, right yeah. Our problem. Oh, and that back building is not the right height, right behind that building. Um, I don't have a lot of flexibility on that back elevation. Because it's a zero lot one. Yeah, that's it in the lower left. I can't have any windows on it and it has to be non-combustible. So I can have some trim. That's about it. It's stucco base. So. Can you just explain why for people? Um... Once you get closer to the prop, uh, closer than three feet from the property line, 
you can't have any windows at all unless they, well, no, you can't have any openings at all. Because the theory is that fire, if you had a fire in your building or a fire in the neighboring building, it could go out the windows, which it often does because windows explode. And um, or firefighters knock them down. And the fire spreads quickly um, that way through windows. So, yeah, I wish I could do more with that, but I can't. <laughs> um, we could do no, I wasn't training, asking so. if... if I was wondering just if we had jurisdiction looking from that direction or not. So you'll see that little parapet there with a little to the left. If you're looking at that lower left elevation, there's a parapet with roof deck beyond it. And then a raised portion, which is um, the enclosed space. And so did that change from it was a fence before? Is that true? Was it a fence before? Well, or is it, is it solid it, now? It, the old house, it was built as a post and panel system. Mm -hmm. What we'd like to do now is have it be a real parapet, a, a wall that's continuous with the wall below it. Mm -hmm. So you can see in the plan, the upper plan is the third floor. Most of it is stair, and then there's a the front part that's a little penthouse place, and then you can see the roof deck. That's the fire station. Oh, that's the fire station. Yeah. On that upper right hand diagram, Tom, yeah. left of the um, stair and down, that um, the area with lines on it, is that an overhead trellis or something? Or no, that's just uh, like a wooden roof deck. Then what's the remainder of the roof? It would be rubber roof. Oh, okay. Maybe solar panels. No planting in the area. No, no. That's, that's part of the aging and getting better process. <laughs> so no, you don't have to do much. I know, yeah. <laughs> You'd never see it if you behind the parapet. So. I realize I have no jurisdiction to say that. <laughs> that still make the plug. <laughs> <laughs> I, just want, I'm just going back to the fencing. Uh, there's fencing on the existing building, is that true? Yeah, that was a budget-saving measure. It was the originally fencing. a real... Or the... You, you, the parapet be, be, being a post and panel system, yeah. It was originally a parapet, and then we changed it to the fencing to save some money. Uh -huh. So, so uh, yeah, uh -huh. what it is is it's, it's uh, wood posts with um, hardy panel applied to it mm -hmm. in the stucco finish, and it, it, it um, was painted, and it originally looked exactly like the color of the stucco below but the colors have changed over time. So. Oh, so it's not a transparent kind of, like a metal fencing Maybe or I'm something? I'm not sure what you're looking at. That's here. Oh, no, that's all solid. Okay, that's, that's solid. and it's solid on the existing. Yes, right, okay. yeah, that's all solid. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Um, this is probably open up the public, it's just for a public comment, so. Can I come back? Yep, yeah. come on back. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I represent two of Butters. They can't be here. Like I said before, my name's Bill Arnold. And uh, I'm all for uh, advancement. And, you know, I mean, I work the year for We've done a lot of improvements down there, a lot, and there's a lot to come. You're going to get solar panels there, aren't you? They're already up. We're yeah, feeding the grill. Up. We're feeding the grid like you don't know what. The meter's turning backwards, which is really <laughs> unusual for an airport. <laughs> We have, we've, we've done a lot there. I'm just one of the people that service these airplanes that go over your head every day and have been doing it for daggone near 30 years. Silent. But I happen to know a couple of young ladies that uh, one, and the reason I'm here is because they're working. One's a nurse at uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital and the other's a musician. They have a uh, concert this weekend in Springfield. They have to have rehearsal. So they asked me to come and speak their mind. Um, I've been in the situation, and I look at the plans, and I see that they've come up with an agreement with the butter, and one of the things was the distance away from his property, which has to do with the easement, which I can understand. He can't get to his property. He's got a problem. The other is that uh, I don't know why it is grayed out, but... Uh, 
35 State Street on that plan is grayed out. It doesn't represent a depiction of how the actual property is. There is a, and there's one picture in here. Why don't you go back to the picture? The one where you're looking back from Mason Street through the easement. Where you can see the tree. Right, where you can oh, see okay. the tree, yep. Look behind the tree. There it is, right there. If you see that, it's a peak house. That red door is actually an access to 35 State Street, Apartment D. Around the other side is Apartment A, where you can't see it. What they did in the original plan when they graded out is they made a block. It's not a block. It's it's stepped down as apartment, and there's a screen porch and a uh, a view of the of the area. Uh, that building were it to be constructed, if you were to stand on and there's another picture in here of the staircase. If you were to stand on that staircase and reach your hand out, you'd be able to touch that building. Yeah, see, there's a staircase. Okay, so now you could stand on that staircase. The staircase is wood, by the way. It's a uh, press board, uh, you know, uh, that stuff they make uh, patios out of. External. Like a Trex or something? Yeah, it's that. And uh, uh, underneath that, with the trees, <laughs> that's the tree is actually hiding this equipment. Uh, first off, let me say that there's two businesses in that building. One is uh, 35 State Street, which is uh, uh, sort of a psycho business that has, you know, they care. It's not, it's not interfering with them because they have no windows or anything on the back. And the other one is Robinson Real Estate. He has no uh, problems with it. The problem is with not the business people who are there. It's with the residents who are there. One of the residents is working. The other residents, which is A, is working, D is working, and they're just in the area. The C residents, he moved to California. That's Ying. He moved to California. So he doesn't, I don't even think he knows that this is going on. But he actually owns a property in that condominium. So what I'm saying is that if you put that building five feet from that area, I would be able to stand on that porch and take my hand and touch that building. Just to, uh, we're looking at the plans. I think you might be thinking the building goes over far. I think the building. No, it doesn't. The building, I've seen the plans. And on the plan, it says five feet. It's at an angle, so it goes from five oh, to right. eight. Oh, I mean, it might be five We're talking about the back area. wall. Right, but I'm talking about if, it's, if the, the wall is here, the wall is going to go up here. It's not going to go anywhere near the stairs. The wall is going to go up. See where these cars are? One, two, three, four. This is the fifth car. And the building will be over this car. So it'll go up like this. And it'll be 25 well, feet from here to there. So it'll be open. The building is going to be approximately 10 feet from his property. 17 feet. 17 feet. 17 feet. Well, 17, the corner's yeah. going to be just to the left of the tree. Right here? Yeah. Just to the left. That's right. not the how the plan, that original plan was not like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to go anywhere near the stairs. Now. So what you're saying, if I can understand this correctly, I'm very thick, you have to tell me several times, because somebody's going to ask me this. Um, the edge of that building where that uh, tower is that he's been talking about is here, will come, will come, I would be able to see that door. Yeah. That, that, uh, That's my entrance and exit to uh, the D from the street. Right. The only thing that would be missing is that tree. And the building, the front of the building, if, if Alex is correct, will go to the left of the tree, so just to the left. Just to the left. So right here, so that whole stairway, that door is going to be, it's going to be open. open. Yeah. Now, you can't see it, but if you look very closely and you look midways the tree, that's a studio. Where? And if, right there where you have that, that's a studio with yeah. several windows. Now, I, I don't know about that. I know for a fact that that door was a real problem. I mean, it, it was, these people were having a, a conniption yeah, about that. Yeah, I could still be a problem. And what I don't understand 
me being a neutral person, and I've been in, involved in a lot of, I worked at other airports, I've been involved in a lot of airport and construction. Usually, anybody who's in a butter, someone representing the builder contacts them and gives them a model or something to go by other than a, no? No, you said to get notified that there's something, that there's a hearing, but there's, the, builder, the, the applicant doesn't have to go to every butter for okay. the model and show it to well, them. I had to go to him. But that's because he had the easement. Okay, I understand now. So that's my, that's not, that's their concern. I don't, it's a concern. I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, that's, that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I did, um, in terms of getting in touch with people, um, I was in touch with, with all the others, including... Um, but she called you. I was there when she did it. Right. But I, I sent her the plans. Uh, so I wanted everyone to be really aware of what was going on. The plan uh, so looked, excuse me, the plan looked different. Okay, it was closer to his property. Uh, am I right or wrong? Yeah. No, no, oh, yeah, it was just an earlier version. Okay. We, we were out there with the tape a lot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right, yeah, all right. That's... Um, so any other members of the public here speak to us? Uh, th are there, the utilities are all going to be in that in the first floor in that back. Like, there's not going to be anything in that room. Yeah. Air conditioning. Um, is there? If there was something, something like an air conditioning con condensing unit or something like that. Oops, sorry. Hidden by the screen. Oops. Not on the parapet, eh? Yeah, it would probably be. In the lower parapet section, right there. Noise is the issue. Since we're right up, you know, we look right out of that. Yeah, I think Seth's very aware of that because it's live on my condensing giant rooftop units are right next to his living room. So <laughs> he's not trying not to do that to somebody else. <laughs> um, any other questions for the public? Um, there was one um, book. You want to read the, what did you determine about the roof? Yeah, so the, um, the roof, the definition of height is taken from the, is the vertical distance from the average finished grade um, to the top of the structure of the highest roof base of a flat roof or the deck of a mansard roof and blah, 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 blah. But this is a flat roof, so it would go to the highest roof beam of a flat roof. So if that, in fact, Roof beam is at 32 feet, then that would be okay. Um, the and meaning you wouldn't need a special, they wouldn't need a special permit for the height. There is another item actually I just noticed. Um, um, it looks like the setback change. We talked a lot about the five foot setback. I don't know if that's been addressed which, again. Which setback? A um, maximum of a five foot setback. From where? From, from where? 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 This way? Where? Um, I don't, still don't know what setback we're talking about. Front setback. Right there. It's a, there's a building showing two a line. Ten foot setback. Oh, oh. And it's okay. supposed to be five. So if there's a building code, I mean, certainly it's in the public hearing, you got, the board could grant a special permit for the setback oh, okay. for the front lot line. We, actually, well. and we have changed that. I'm sorry. That did, that's gone, gone back and forth. But it's now only two feet. The okay. setback is only two feet. I'm sorry. But there's been a lot of negotiations now we're, and I'll give you this plan, but we're basically two feet off of the structure, it's two feet off of the property line okay. on all sides except for the rear. The rear is in the corner, right up against it. Okay. So let's just talk about that for one second. So if the roof, the flat part of the roof is 32 feet as it's been proposed, and the front lot line is two feet, not 10, there really isn't a reason for the planning board to vote. But you can't change the plans. <laughs> These have to be the plans. Well, so if you change yeah. the plans again and the building drops below 30 feet, yes. or that front setback drops below 5, right. yeah. then you do. So right. are these plans done? The, those two elements will not change at all. <laughs> it, I, if the design changes somewhat, I, I know that I have to come back for a review from these guys. I, I know or that. if it changes to the point where you have to come back to us. Right. Yeah. 
I don't want to come back to the planning board. We don't want to change the setback or the height. Right. Okay, so as it stands right now, then, the planning board is going to take a vote. So the DPW comments are applied to the central business permit, or do we have to vote on those? Well, no, you don't have to. I, I mean, there are basic technical standards about the water lines um, about weren't shown and that kind of thing. So they would get, they would be reviewed when they came for a building permit anyway. So these are issues that we need to cover for the permit, okay. necessarily. So then, uh, So we can just have central business decide what they want to do. Right, so but, but, but since we've opened the hearing, do we have to just, do well, they withdraw have, their? Yeah, I think it's the cleanest way is to withdraw because the permit's no longer necessary. So, so we're going to ask request. you guys to request a withdrawal of a permit from the planning board, and we can vote on that. In writing or here? No, we can do it right here. Oh, can I request a withdrawal from the hearing, please? You get a permit. permit. So that's what we're going to vote on. But I want to give the Central Business Architecture Committee time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you... I, I just, um, the north and south elevations, did those change as well? Uh, that's north. So this is actually what... Uh, the Ansel Wright building owners will be looking at. And then the south, nobody will ever see it because it's basically right up against, but that's it, it's a big stucco wall. I have one last question. Um, so that blue building that we saw in the back, was there a door that would be? Yeah, that's my question. And I, I, I know this doesn't have anything to do with your building because you created the fire separation, but does that now cause a situation where they have to seal off all the openings? I, I don't think so. I, I, it's up to the building inspector because sometimes buildings are built right up against other buildings and the old one has windows and they're not asked to seal them up. So I don't know what the code requirements are. Like to make a motion if there's no other discussion. Uh, I move, move that we approve the submission as submitted. Okay. Okay. Yeah, can I close the public hearing? Uh, so, uh, so yes, we, we motion to close, close the public hearing. Okay. I second that. All in favor? Uh, now, now I move that we accept the application as submitted. I approve it. I second. All in Whoops. favor? Anyway. Yeah. We screwed up again. <laughs> well, the application as submitted. Oh, sorry. Was submitted. So you need to as presented. Um, and then um, <coughs> I think it would probably be appropriate um, to request to, to, to request the condition about the easements be so that you know that's what's going to be built and it's not going to change, essentially. That the agreement to But that is that even our purview? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I mean, if, if they... Uh, if they wanted to change the design, mean, we're voting to approve it as it's presented tonight. Okay. So if they change yeah. it, we have to see it again anyway. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'd like to amend my motion now. That I move that we approve the submission as presented tonight and we require a plan uh, to the same. A second. All in favor? <laughs> so we're going to need a motion to close our public hearing. Uh, so the applicant was asked to, um, can, can we have, to have a motion to adjourn first? I move to adjourn. Second. So we're all done. Yep. Yep. So the only thing we have to do is vote on um, David Dahl the permit. So I guess a motion to accept. Do you want Second.
proceed for subsequent amendment, special permit amendment for the Oaks, to clarify permit conditions and lot conditions with regard to lot layout, and clarify the parcel steps that will require on the Yeah, I don't know how to close that out. I got my thing. Yeah, it's game. It's game. It's game. Yeah, Hi, I'm Ted Parker. I'm representing the applicant. Um, when this project was originally permitted in 2003, the original applicant, uh, the, the assumption about the uh, flow rates, water flow rates in the neighborhood was, uh, was that they were very low. And uh, the original applicant offered as a condition of approval that all the houses in the subdivision be uh, sprinkled for the residential with a NFPA approved 13B sprinkler system. We have recently conducted fire flow tests, three fire flow tests, one last summer and two in the last eight weeks, all of which have indicated that we have more than sufficient fire flow to satisfy current subdivision regulations, which would allow the houses that are served by municipal water to uh, not need residential sprinkler systems, and we're asking to be, to have those houses that are served by the municipal water system to be relieved from the requirement on, that was a, a condition of the original permit that they be sprinkled. It's pretty simple. Um, I think uh, we went to the fire department, discussed it with them, and Chief Duggan uh, agreed that it was a reasonable request, and the DPW reviewed it and also saw it was a reasonable request. Anything else? No. no. Questions from the board? Great. I think it's a reasonable request. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> My question is why would I go against the DPO accepting? That's also a question. Approved request by Oak Ridge Road LLC for subdivision amendment and special permit amendment for the Oaks to clarify permit conditions, lot references, to revise lot layout, and clarify the parcels that will require on site fire pit suppression of parcels originally located on that 36 68 Oak Ridge Road on this map. So, yeah. so favor? Oh. 
Well, not every day. Oh. One sure. I believe that he would. Wow. Yeah, that's what we can put in the PowerPoint. He may have updated the PowerPoint. Yeah. 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 Oh, this is the okay, yeah. There's five sheets in here. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. shows that resolution. There is a, an eight-foot walkway on the left side of the plan, which is the west side of our property, that, will, that continues down through and through the Beechwood uh, Park, or the Beaches Park, down to Mosier Street. Um, it's been agreed that a five-foot uh, concrete walkway will, will run on the, on the north side of the park in front of our first three homes. And that uh, on the far side, on the north side of <coughs> Ford Crossing, that uh, sidewalk has been widened to eight feet so that it uh, conforms to a, an agreement for a multi-use path. So uh, that's what all the excitement is about. And uh, um, it's a good resolution. You know, there, there aren't 10-foot sidewalks, which was a subject of some consternation about scale. Um, but, and, uh, but they're not four-foot, so they're, they clearly offer that that uh, central spine that's been, been talked about. And I think there was a discussion with the staff and, uh, and that development about the further development of linkage paths uh, in the inner campus areas. Um, we're, we're negotiating, just so you know, Wright Builders is negotiating with Mass Development for this area to the, uh, to the west of Beachwood. Uh, we'll be back to see you in a little while, uh, with 26 or 28 attached units there. And just today we were on site um, looking at the options for, for connecting these spines in an intelligent way. So I think uh, the consternation that you experienced last uh, uh, three weeks ago has actually stimulated uh, the awareness and the need to 
solve the walkway pedestrian access things, you know, integrally at the beginning of the process rather than than, uh, than sort of adding them in at the end. So that, that's a constructive outcome if you can take any pleasure in that. Uh, I invite you to do so. So, Jeff, did you want to add any items? I think Jeff Squires no, from uh, uh, Berkshire Design. Yeah, I don't think we received some email comments from DPW um, in response to some revised plans showing these walks that we submitted last Thursday. Um, there were a couple of minor um, utility related items. Um, that were addressed in plans that were you know, provided to them um, this afternoon. Um, but I did speak with Dave Valletta, um, and he seemed to you know, be satisfied with all the revisions that were made. So. Did the DPW have any comments that they sent to you? That we have uh, a site basement plan. Do you have to inform the applicant of that? Yeah, no, they got them, so there was a lot of back and forth. Yeah. Um, crossing emails, but they addressed all the. So DPW did send comments. I sent them on to the applicant. And one, and one of the big one of the big issues just in, is um, in speaking with Dave is he had forgotten that that common drive was actually part of mass development submission, and so that you know there was some coordination going on, and so just a division of you know whose responsibility was what, but it was you know he was he was satisfied with, with what we um, agreed upon. So well, all those all those items that came forward to you last time about copper instead of plastic, all yeah. of that stuff that's resolved. So there, did the DPW did the DPW have to sign off on this, or they signed off as part of the subdivision? No, so they don't have to sign off on this. Um, the only thing was that, um, in terms of DPW, was that the stormwater calculations were all addressed through just the stormwater piece. Doug Mitchell signed the, um, um, that piece of it. So they signed off on their piece for the required piece of it um, before you can close your hearing. So it's definite for us. Um, and I'm going to say, you know, uh, Thank you, uh, and I know Beth, you've been involved in these conversations. I think it's great to hear that you guys are going to look at this like a, a holistic look at the past through this area. I think that'll be a, go a long way to making a, a smoother and faster permitting process, as we all saw from our last meeting. It was, you know, it, we, we, it's very important to us. That aspect of that whole development is very important to us. So um, thank you for you know, looking at that. Um, the only question I had, and just one, is uh, the sidewalk, the north sidewalk on Port Crossing is going to be expanded. Do we have to amend the subdivision because uh, of that? I talked to Carolyn about this, and we can, we're can we going to submit the mylars with the corrected eight-foot sidewalk and, and by your signature on that. that okay, so you don't need a vote to amend that. We're not, we're, that's not necessary. Right, so what's going to happen is as with any subdivision, the applicant, once they get approval for a subdivision, has to come with you with a final drawings that incorporate all the conditions and um, there's a mylar set, the original, to get recorded at the registry of deeds, but before they can be recorded, the whole, the majority of the planning board has to sign them, so you remember signing through all those sheets before. So what will happen is they'll incorporate this design change into the final mylar before it comes to you, and that should be coming, I mean, given that you want yeah. to construct this summer, it's going to come relatively soon, so you will see the redesign of the north side in those mylars, and by your signature, you will be essentially signing off on that new design. Um, but so even though this isn't part of the site, this, what we're voting on tonight, requires that. I mean, right, right, okay. So essentially, you wouldn't sign off on the mylars if there weren't there. Okay, that's And they couldn't build this without okay. building yeah. the subdivision. They can't build the subdivision yeah. through, through the mylars. Right. Uh, and there was one other piece of it. Um, the declaration of open space conservation area for Beach Street Park, uh, I have a copy of. Right. And um, I think, uh, I can't remember what we, how we decided it last time, but I think we were going to say this has to be recorded before the fourth house. How did you say it? Fifth. You had the fifth Was last it fifth time, house? Yeah. Okay, so this, this, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, it's a declaration and conservation restriction, okay. essentially. So you can, that, I, I, there were five, I think, recommended conditions from essentially from the last time. Um, Can I just read them out? Um, yes. Um, so, um, so actually, let me let me explain a little bit too. So, in the original um, special permit that was granted, there um, because you just looked at this sort of preliminary <coughs> site plan. There's a condition number 27 actually that says that prior to 
construction or build out of any of the lots, a full detailed site plan has to be approved by the planning board because at that point it was, you know, the big picture. So technically the beach park lot has to get re reviewed by site plan. The only thing, the, the big thing in the site plan here would be that bike path connection and then recording as they've shown that this is not going to be built out, but it's really going to be preserved. So I would suggest that in this approval for the six lots, you can also accept um, that this would also stand for the site plan for the Beach Street Park because you've got the layout of the path going all the way down to Moser Street and the, the draft covenant restrictions. So um, I would, I made a recommendation that you know, as part of your approval, um, that um, it constitutes compliance with the site plan requirements um, on that lot, the park lot. So you have to ask for two separate votes. We're going to do this in one. Right, vote. right. I think it could be as one package. And then that, so then the condition one is the eight foot wide bike path, bike head um, path from Ford Crossing to Moser like Street to be constructed prior like to the issuance of the fifth building permit for the site. Alternatively, um, an escrow in the amount of the cost for construction could be posted in a form suitable to the Office of Planning and Development if, for instance, construction wasn't quite completed by the fifth issuance of the fifth building permit. You still hold, could hold out money um, to ensure that that comes forward. Um, and then prior to completion of the six house lots, it's the conservation restriction reported as defined by NPL when you one and the fines and the submissions by Mass Development are recorded. Um, prior to issuance of building permit for any lot, a public access sign should be posted at the sidewalk entrance south of the site at the old anchor site and at the four crossing as the entrance to the at the entrance to the proposed park. Um, just to clarify that it's not just private, you know, private walk. Um, and that the sidewalk and trail links abutting the property shall have a public access easement recorded and held by the city on terms acceptable by the city. Easement shall be recorded prior to the issuance of the fifth building permit. And um, that the sidewalks and the bike head connections are cement concrete. Okay. Just, if I could just comment one piece sure. about that the fifth building permit. Um, Carolyn and I talked about the, the timing of this, and since we're going to be uh, involved in the property to the west, uh, if you've walked that area, you, you, you know that the, the beach, uh, beach Tree Park slopes down to Mosier Street, and uh, the contouring of an accessible pathway there relative to the trees and the existing grade and the development of the property next to it is going to be a delicate matter, and it can be done with finesse or it can be done sort of uh, um, perfunctorily, and we'd prefer the former. That said, we have a contract of mass development that requires them to have that path built by, by uh, September 1st. But in the ensuing months, uh, we now have the opportunity to do that, perhaps in a better integrated way. And so that was the thought I think that Carolyn had about the escrow, was that, that if we get to that point and it's not done, the reason it's not going to be done is because trying to do a better job, not somebody's dragging their feet. Well, and I, I mean, uh, I'm not speaking for the entire world, but um, again, I think what's important to us is that there is a plan, a holistic plan, a cohesive plan. Right. So if, if some of that part of that plan is to give you all the flexibility to do it well, rather mm -hmm. than, uh, I certainly don't want to be the person to shove a sidewalk down your coat and say right. so you build it. We have sidewalks to nowhere already in the city. So, um, well, just yeah. thank you for understanding that because you know we, time marches on and these things get cast in stone and, and uh, uh, codified. And, and uh, we have a good rapport with Mass Development about this issue. And but it's new news over the last three weeks that we are going to be involved in that next property. Right, so and I think you all from the last two them. hearings have heard how you know how mm -hmm. important this, that aspect of the development is to all of us. So. We aren't going to show you any buildings when we come back. We're just going to show you the walk. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> So just gray blobs and walk. <laughs> is there any danger to the root systems of the trees when you no. think about a perfunctory no. sidewalk? The, no, the, the trees are protected and they're, um, 
landscape designers that they use, Fields and Thomas, for this are, are the ones who did the tree inventory originally up there. So, no, that's it's not the hard issue. To see where the Right. Actually go. The one to the left that bends out, it has to bend out uh, and turn back in order to get some additional run distance to, to maintain the pitch. Uh -huh. And where it comes back in, it's going to have to tuck down near some <coughs> buildings that we plan there. Mm -hmm. And those are people's backyards, which sort of tear us up. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be done in a nice way. And it can be. I mean, that, that, it's going to be that gorgeous. Was the, that was the last plan that was like, sent out this afternoon. I don't get a oh, chance yeah. to see it. But it showed the rest of that all mm -hmm. the way to the <coughs> okay. yeah, all the way to the mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board then? Uh, motion to close public hearing. Oh, sorry. I should actually ask first. Uh, is there anybody here from the public who'd like to speak to this? Comments or questions from the board on this one? Um, yes, I think it was a far, far better thing we did three weeks ago by stopping the um, Just as a mark, you are an eligible vote. And you, you are an eligible vote. You will go to the mark. You were here in the last month, aren't you? Yes. No, this is fine. say let's do it tonight, but I, what I want people to do is, I know um, with Catherine leaving, we have something for the CP, CPA, CPC, I think Devin, you expressed an interest, I'm not sure if you're still there. I do, I feel like I belong on transportation and parking, but I've also done that for the whole length of time I've been right. here, and so it might be a good switch. Well, we are going to have one new member, there was a woman, uh, yeah. Sarah Youngwood, Sarah? I think so. Yeah, yeah she's been appointed. I wasn't sure. I knew she went for an hour. I don't know if she's been. She hasn't come back yet. Back yet. She's recommended by the mayor. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure if she's a lawyer. Um, she works with the city. 
So we do have. Uh, so we do have one new uh, person. So I'm not sure what her interests are, but um, I think if you decide you want to do the CPA, I think then you know that's an open up a spot, and we're going to we can assign her. You know. Yeah. Well, no, no. But as the, as the new person, she can pick up the line. Great. Isn't she a project manager for Springfield? Oh no, you're almost gone. So nice to see you back in. He comes in there, he's like, oh, I love you guys too. Um, so we are going to have an opening on CPA. Um, we are going to have, that means that we're also going to have, if Devin does take it, then we have an opening on um, transportation. Um, uh, and Maryland, um, I didn't know if you would let everybody know. Yes, I did. You did, okay. So, uh, Maryland, uh, position at Ed Lewis, do you want to just give everybody a briefing? What, Ed Lewis, a monthly meeting. Ed Lewis, a monthly meeting, and it, it used to be actually quite interesting, and then it sort of, um, you know, it sort of, with, uh, to, to the back, uh, and we actually have a mayor. Uh, so I think the, with the transition of a new mayor and uh, you know one of the councilors leaving, it, we, we haven't met for a really long time. But it's economic development, <coughs> so it's a really important committee. All, a lot of our stuff goes through. Edmund. That's what I thought. I thought Edmund yeah. has to sign off. <coughs> Yeah, they do, it, and it's a, it's it's been in the past. I was on it when I was a city council, and that's why I was interested in continuing because it's you know in very interesting stuff uh, with relationship to economic development and land use in the city. So <coughs> I would assume that it would be picking up steam as things you know, the committee still and and, and, uh, and I think that councilors are. Gene Casey, Paul Spector, um, I think the word, oh. yeah, I think all of them, uh, Amy Daniels is on there still. And it seems like they're doing more. But it's a good committee. So that's something. Well, I think 5 or 5 30 on uh, Monday. Oh, okay, so that's going to be something for Monday. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then. There's one out here, Zoning Revision Committee, that's pretty much over, so uh, that doesn't um, really affect us. So, um, the next meeting, Carolyn, do we have much on the agenda for our next meeting? We just have one minor permit, and then I'd like to do zoning stuff. And then let's do... It's a continuation of Kensington State. Woohoo! That should be quick. Mm -hmm. um, so, what I'd like you all to do then is, uh, we know there's Edley, CPA, Transportation, um, at the next meeting, we're going to make these decisions. I'm not sure if Jen, you're still with the housing. Oh, yeah. um, Brandy, Mar uh, Mark, I think you said you're still interested in the um, uh, capital, capital improvements. Yeah. Andrew, Tree, one of you. Space is fine. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, Edley might be something that's interesting. Yeah, Edley really might be interesting. I have to think about whether I can do my day to find space. Right, that's the, the timing. So, Just so you guys know, Edley is a non voting member. Yes, right. Oh, our representative doesn't vote. Right. Okay. Correct. Get the Only the council yeah. votes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cabinet, right. Mm -hmm. They sit at the big table. Okay. Okay. Um, you still don't vote. Maybe <laughs> 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 maybe I'll get promoted to full person. That's right. We can talk a lot. Um, Why did you get fill one of the slots? Because until you have your gone, there's no slot. So. Quite a bit. Yeah, eventually. It's a mayor of, yeah. Yeah, but it's up to David. It's up to David. Um, all right, so we have one, we have Kensington, and then we're going to do assignments, so. And then zoning stuff, the residential stuff, I think I'm going to have it too. <sighs> all righty, Wayne, not that we don't want to see you, but you yeah. want to get out of here. Sure. <coughs> it's you always good to see you, because you don't show up to meetings anymore. <laughs> you don't show up, why not? Because you're so hostile to me. <laughs> 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 So, um, in your package, you got the uh, preliminary plan for the expansion of Elm Street Historic District. That's what I'm here to talk about. So, um, the process is we have an historic district in Elm Street that goes basically from the edge of the high school, just east of the high school, to St. Mary's Church, 
We've had that for a decade or so. Um, there's a lot of interest in expanding the district up to, to Roundhill Road. So a map, if you pass that, you see red is the existing district and yellow is the proposed new district. Um, the, the Elm Street Historic District Committee has been, or Elm Street Historic District Committee has been talking about this for about 10 months. Um, they adopted a preliminary report last, last month. The process is that the public comment, the 60-day public comment, it comes to you, it comes to the Historic Commission, it comes to Mass Historic. They then hold a public hearing on May 21st, and then they make a final recommendation to City Council, and City Council does whatever they want to do. So this is before you to give you a chance to have comments on it. Um, so what the, the preliminary report concludes is there should be something to preserve the history of Round Hill, um, something regulatory, two potential ways to do it. One is expanding the historic district to go up Round Hill. The other is to get voluntary preservation, historic preservation his agreements from Clark School um, for the most important properties. The idea is a, a historic district has a lot of protection on all the buildings, but it's not absolute. It doesn't stop them from tearing down a building. It doesn't stop a horrible building. Historic preservation restriction would be on far fewer buildings, but it's much stronger. Um, and so the report says we should be considering both those things for the process. The neighborhood would definitely like, the, the neighborhood that, other than Smith College and Clark School, we definitely like a historic district. Um, and the report's sort of saying we should be talking about this. So it's before you for, for that. The property, this includes a few private properties, although those properties are sort of mature, they're not going anywhere. It includes some Smith College properties, and then mostly includes Clark School properties. Um, Clark School has a prospective buyer, Opal Real Estate. And Opal is actually fine with historic district. Because if Opal goes forward, they're going to be doing it on National Park Service tax credits, historic preservation tax credits, and though, which would pay you know a few million dollars the project. In return for that federal money, those restrictions are so restrictive that they're much tougher than the local regulations. So from Opal's standpoint, it's fine. Clark School, and we think the Opal deal will happen. Clark School's concern is if the Opal deal falls through, it probably falls through because nobody can use the building or it can use all the buildings. And so if Opal falls through, it may mean the market just can't support the reuse of the building. And so Clark's worried, well, if you lose Opal, and then there's a historic district in, in place, you know, they, it may be actually make historic preservation more difficult for some of the buildings. The time, so part of this is this parallel strategy is, by the time council votes, we're going to know if Opal's buying the property. If Opal buys the property, they're happy with the historic district, the neighborhood's happy with the historic district, and I'm assuming City Council will be happy with it. It's the fallback where I think is the most controversy, frankly. There's one one additional little caveat is that just last week City Council took their first reading on the change to the historic um, buildings um, provision for educational and religious uses. So there is one piece of a potential puzzle that is already essentially in place. So this takes forever to adopt or make changes, there is that other third fallback position, I guess I would say. So if reuse of buildings for Oakland didn't work, then there's still the allowance by site plan approval to allow different uses for some of those buildings. But, um, so, you know, it's another way of protection. I mean, our position's always been sort of two things from a staff standpoint. One is that you don't get historic preservation unless it's a an economic return on doing the building. So the reason for zoning is to make sure that the buildings can be used vibrantly. The second is regulations are really important to encourage people to preserve the buildings, but that it's much easier when you have a mature district. So all the studies are, if you have a residential neighborhood, historic districts add value, because most people are going to keep their homes, and there's a few idiots who want to ruin it for everybody, and so historic districts are really valuable. It's a lot harder for surplus institutional property. Where you, I mean, this happened to State Hospital. We lost a major redeveloper of the State Hospital when it went on the, na went on the National Register um, because somebody just wasn't interested in the risk of, of not being able to carry down the bill. Um, and so that, that's why this is more difficult. Or What's that? And down anyway. Yeah. Right. How does the uh, educational overlay affect, or does it the 
Smith property that It doesn't really because the Smith itself has surplus mill. So the educational overlay says to the extent it's being used by any educational institution. So Smith or someone buys the properties, they have enormous flexibility. But as soon as it becomes non-education, the underlying zoning is what applies. And that applies to residence homes as well. I thought there was it only applies to buildings used for education, not to residents. No, it would apply to supporting uses as well. Um, but you know, so so Smith and, and the thing is Smith it originally we thought they were going to sell the building slowly. It looks like they're now going to be looking for a master developer to buy everything other than Bedford Terrace. So Bedford Terrace is probably going to sell individual buildings. Mm -hmm. The rest of the buildings, they're probably going to wait for a master developer. And because they haven't begun to build the new dorms to replace them, that's still some number of years down the line. So Smith, we should be aware of. The main building that Smith has, I think it's called Tully Hall, which is surplus. Um, Clark School is planning to actually lease. So Clark will be selling most of the buildings. They need a little more space. They're going to lease that. Um, so except for Bedford Terrace, Smith is a longer-term thing. Okay. So uh, are you just giving us a heads-up plan? Are you looking? Can we so you're rec so we're required to give this to you to, for you to make a recommendation. So you can make no recommendation. You can make any recommendation you want. You make a recommendation before you've had the public meeting. Right. We're required actually. We're required to wait 60 days to give you and everybody else a chance to make recommendations. So we can't even go to the public here until you've had your chance to talk. So do you, would you like us to do it tonight? Or do you want to I'd love to do it tonight if you're ready, but, uh, you know. Um, uh, I mean, the, the key thing for me is your your 60 days runs out on May 17th. So I need enough you're meeting May 21st. 21st. Right. Yeah. So I need you to do it by the 17th. If you want to do it tonight, that's great. But if you need more time, that's fine, too. Um, anybody want to come back next Tuesday? Hell no. So this is May. No, May. This is May, so you still have time. Yeah. Oh, May 17th. Oh, no. Nah. Uh, <laughs> well, I, actually, I mean, I, let's, I mean what, does anybody have any questions or concerns about this? I mean, this is. Maybe I don't understand it well enough. Trenching thing that doesn't make sense, but I don't see Well, the only thing that they would, what are the brand, so that whole area becomes historic district. That means the neighborhoods have, that, that there's, a, there's a neighborhood committee, the Elm Street Historic Committee, made up of members of, the committee, of that neighborhood. But they don't have any ability to, to deny permits. It's not like central business. Uh, no, it's actually strong in central business in some respects. So they have the absolute ability to deny demolition, to say, can't tear down the building whatsoever. Not in just the one year building. They can just Ever. forever. Forever. Yeah. Now, they do have to, there's a three step process. First, you get what's called a certificate of non applicability, which says the rules don't apply to you. Some things are exempt, roof colors, those kind of things. Second is civic of appropriateness, which says a building's appropriate with the district. And the third is whenever they turn down civic of appropriateness, they automatically have to do what's called civic of hardship. There are some buildings which, even though they're the most valuable buildings in the world and shouldn't come down, just can't be reused. Mm -hmm. so, so they can turn out a building, but they have to find that it's, the building's actually reusable. But does it have design guidelines? Uh, it does. It has design guidelines. It so they also have a lot of flexibility for new buildings. What they don't, it's not a backward door approach to zoning. They can't limit a building by how massive it is or what the use is. Nothing to do with use, it has nothing to do with trees, it has nothing to do with landscaping. Um, they, they don't have to do with the size of the building per se, except in a, how does it fit in with the district, how it has design issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Campus Center is a good example. Campus Center was discussed for a year, it was revised, Elm Street eventually approved it, but they would have been within their rights not to approve. And they approved it in part because the earlier version was so much worse. But yeah. Good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> so all we're, all we're voting is to move it forward. Right. Yeah. So well, I was just yeah. wondering, what are, what are the downsides of, do, of doing this? Um, one? Yeah. If, so the downside of doing historic district, mm -hmm. if Opal doesn't buy the property, is it, it could have a chilling effect on investors. Investors may say, look, I can save three buildings. I can't save all seven buildings. So it's sort of cons it, it acts as a constraint on this. On right, right. So that, that's why, at least for now, the recommendation is let's look at both options, historic district and historic preservation. So we've been negotiating with Clark School saying we think there's four buildings that are most critical. If you put historic preservation restriction on those four buildings that face the street, then that might be enough. Then we don't need the whole district. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of the neighborhood wants every building protected. Um, they keep saying they want to see. You know, it's the same discussion you all have about special permits. In theory, the, the, the board could be really flexible and allow change of uses. 
but it just scares away some investors. You know, I mean, so, uh, you know, and, and particularly if Opal fails, then that sort of, I mean, because Opal is a pretty good project, and, and I think if anybody can make it work, it's going to be Opal. And does the city want this big, a, an area of kind of constraint on development? Do they, does the city want this to go Let's fast forward. Let's imagine Clark School is redeveloped, um, and you have mature uses there. Then absolutely, those are really important buildings we should say. The fear for, so, that, so, so it should be protected, and those buildings are great. The fear I have is if we result in having empty buildings that eventually fall apart, we're not doing anybody any favors. Um, and so my recommendation, which has not been the, the neighborhoods, has been we should do this parallel track. If Opal goes forward to a historic district, if Opal doesn't do historic preservation restrictions. The neighborhood wants to jump, or many people in the neighborhood want to jump just to historic district. Um, Does it take a certain number of neighbors to vote for it, or just city council? It's just city council and it's a two-thirds vote. So that's, you know, as a practical matter, like zoning, a two-thirds vote means you need some consensus in council. Yeah. You know, and so, and Clark School gets this, and I suspect that if Clark School is really trying to work with us and preserve four buildings, they're less likely to get six votes to do a historic preservation. What's the status of Opal? They're, they're doing their due diligence right now. Um, I'm assuming they're applying for you all. They need a site plan approval for the entire project and possibly a special permit for two buildings, depending on the, the details of it. And they're going through their due diligence. I just had an appraiser cop, stop by yesterday, so that's sort of an outside approach. I mean, from everything we can tell, their concept is valid. It, it would work. They could, they could find these uses. They're going to replace the condos that were lost, I mean, replace the apartment rentals, the, the high end apartments we used to have that we've lost with some condo conversions in the last 10 years. In essence, they'd be replacing. So think about DA Sullivan School, which was pretty high rental, and they're now condos. So people who, you know, doctors who come to for rotation to Bay State, who have money but don't want to buy a place, there's not really a great market for them. So that's the market. We think that market's real. The part that I'm suspicious about is could you really fill 75 units in a couple of years? You know, if you give a 10-year build-out, it's probably very realistic. If you need two years to make the numbers work, I don't think it's all realistic. And that's, I think, a lot of the due diligence is going on. So, Wayne, what's the timing? So this, so May 21st, this is the discussion is to expand the historic uh, district. But between now and then, you're working with Opal on those four properties to get historic preservation. And if that happens, then this becomes, that's all that, that's what the city would prefer, at least those four buildings. So if, well, I don't want to talk about the city because there's so many different players right, involved, right. but if Opal's deals goes forward, at least from the staff standpoint, I think the historic district is great. If Opal's deal fails, then a historic preservation of four buildings is, is my recommendation. I guess the, I'm asking, where's the timing of the negotiations with Opal on those four properties? Where is that in relation to the May 21st? So we're not talking to Opal about the four properties. Oh, okay. If they go forward, historic district, we're all happy. We're talking to Clark School about the four properties. Okay. The idea being, if Opal walks, we'd be ready to go with that four properties. Right. So would, there's no... would that interfere with the sale if they put a historic preservation? So we would be ready to go. So if the sale to Opal happens, they wouldn't do a historic preservation restriction. Oh, I see. And then finally, so much of this is based on Opal. And that's, when, when, I'm sorry, when did you say that's going to... You know, part of the thing is because we're not privy to the deal. We had heard they were aiming to close in June. But we also heard they wanted a permit from you, and they haven't applied for it yet. So I, I'm assuming that means that things are being delayed, but no one's told us that. Right? I mean, you know, because they have to apply 30 days before you act, and then there's an appeal period after that. So they have to be at least two and a half months from closing. Is, is my guess, but I just don't know. Okay. And is this the last time we'll have to make a recommendation on this, or will this have to come back to us? This is the last time you have to make a recommendation. Obviously, you're welcome to spend more time if you want. But, but this is, you don't, it won't come back to us before it goes to the council or after yeah. city council. It won't be referred out. It won't be referred out. Um, city council is not required to refer it out to anybody ordinance committee. They may choose to. But the, the only audit, unlike the zoning ordinance, which comes to you, historic district ordinance is the only requirement to ordinance committee. Now, that doesn't mean they wouldn't refer it to you. But, um, and we haven't done this in so long. I don't remember what it is. That would be something that would come before Yeah. And, and incidentally, that would be a fair recommendation. If you want to say you'd like it to be referred, I'm absolutely sure council would refer it to you if you asked them to. I'm not sure if they do what they do if you didn't specifically ask them. I'm not sure. If, I mean, honestly, I think it's a political, it's a very, if you end up being, a, it could become a very political decision. And I think, and, and people can weigh in on this, I think I'm fine voting today to move it forward because I think it's a, it, it, as long as, it works for 
works out that Opal is it uh, is the buyer and they get these, that's fine. And that if Opal doesn't get it, you, there's another way to preserve some of this building outside of that as well. So I think. I agree. Now, where, where does that leave the historic district proposition? I mean, you're talking about preserving the four buildings. I mean, but I'm in favor of the whole historic district also. Well, we're talking about that's what's what being we asked do. is to go to maintain both possibilities going forward. Yeah. Yes, but, but just to be clear, the only reason Opal would do four, I mean, I'm sorry, the only reason Clark School would agree to four buildings is if it was instead of a historic district. Right. Um, and I, I mean, I don't disagree again if Opal buys the property. The question is if they don't absorb it. So, yes, it might at some point be a decision point of one versus the other. Doesn't that make it less valuable to Opal? Really? Which way? Anytime you tie their hands. Right, so Opal, so so that to the final, no document would actually be signed until we knew one way or another about Opal. So if Opal buys the property, there wouldn't be any historic preservation restriction, and they're not worried at all about the historic district. Because Opal is going to get this this oh, cuts of this thing. Opal making a change to the site. And they're going to have a farm where we have they have. Say Opal, say it, the, the whole project floods and Opal wants to dump it in three to five years. So, so that's why Opal's, so, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, then it, to me it would make the... Right. I think that's true. I think Opal is assuming they've gone far enough in their due diligence that if they buy the property, they're pretty convinced that won't happen. But you're absolutely right. There's still a risk that they're wrong. Uh, the, there's one other issue just to mention. It's also an issue that, that um, comes up. So Opal's fine with the historic district. They would like a historic district the boundaries like we have on Elm Street. So on Elm Street, all the buildings right along Elm Street are protected. But as soon as you get back into Smith Campus, they're not. The idea being is what really cares what faces the street. Mm -hmm. The equivalent of Clark School is all the almost all, all the big buildings, the buildings that people live in, are right along Clark Street, and they would all be protected. There's three buildings in the rear of the property that Oprah would preserve, not would prefer not to be protected because they may want to tear them down someday. One is the power plant, and they may send a steam power plant that's very inefficient. They may want individual power plants in each building, and then there's two. Um, maintenance buildings. They're all attractive. They're, they're nice brick buildings, but they're not, they don't have that rich history. So are those are the ones grayed out on the, there's three buildings in the back that are gray. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. So Opal's request is they're fine with historic district, but not with those three gray buildings. What's the staff opinion on that? I think it makes sense. I mean, you know, the, the neighborhood's worried about everything, obviously. They're worried about they tear these buildings and build something new, but there's one, I, the neighborhood's mostly been great. There's one thing that's annoyed me a little bit, frankly, is they want all these strict regulations for Opal, but one of the the Historic District Commission looked at is including all of Round Hill. And they were like, oh, no, we don't want you to regulate our property. We want you to regulate right. their property. Right. Right. And I guess it's sort of, it's, you know, development happens, and I want to stop development. And those aren't the core buildings. So I, I'm fine with not including them. But just so you know, the usual process for council, and this has even been more true in the last year, is any one person wants something referred to a committee, they're happy to do it. Okay. They, they never object yes. to someone that's recommended. But if it goes out to ordinance, yeah. if it goes out to ordinance, it doesn't require ordinance to have a joint hearing with us, though. No. Well, uh, but uh, without, right, the parallel track? Yeah. 
yeah. know that it's pretty uh, yeah. Preservation of the four buildings. Four buildings. Yeah. <laughs> and also, yeah, and also, okay, and also the preservation of the four buildings. Uh, second? Second. Seven. Any more discussion? Well, I object to the use of the word westerly twice in one sentence. Oh, no. <laughs> it's conceptual. <laughs> so, this is a long email exchange, yeah. you know. <laughs> Uh, all in favor? All righty, Wayne. Thank you. I'm going to read for 20 minutes. I have a couple of announcements. Oh, shoot. And Wayne, these are out of PDPC tonight. Uh, everybody there is all up in arms over a uh, zoning change coming out of the state legislature that has not come out of committee, but they all seem to think that if it does, it's got terrible implications for all of the local communities because. It, uh, it is not necessarily being characterized as a zoning bill, but rather as an expedited permitting bill. Oh, you want to email about it? Right. So um, it, it actually didn't come out of committee, and uh, the Tuesday morning hearing didn't happen. Uh, the Senate president's message that the legislation will get transparency and due process. So it, evidently it's something to keep an eye on. What I have is their take on it that I've got brought you and Carolyn a copy of. I got a copy of the okay. emails. Um, and then the only other thing that was news tonight from there was um, there is a metropolitan planning organization where the local elected <coughs> officials get together and decide how to use project federal money funds and how it gets distributed down. And there are five tiers of towns that that select delegates, I'm not sure that select is the right word, but that are voted on by the planning commission, and they are all elected officials, but there are five large towns, there are eight next size towns, and so they do it by tiers. We're in the third tier, and uh, Miranakowitz is the selected delegate for the MPO, which I think is a good thing, y'all can read it if you can have it. That's it. Cool. I don't, I mean, <laughs> In terms of the first thing, I don't know if you want to weigh in and make comments to the legislative delegates. They were kind of urging that people do, and uh, Tim Brennan has has offered to send around this email that he sort of took it upon himself to, you know, beat the drum on. So I have heard a couple of briefings about Lupa and Kwatha, or whatever the other one was, the comprehensive one, and this is evidently Lupa too. It's Lupa too because the person who got combined in with the other one never liked the outcome. So it's an effort to serve, and that person is from a housing base. So. Lupa and Lupa too? Lupa and Lupa. All right, we need a motion. Oh. Second. Second. All favor? Yeah. All ready. Thank you, Wayne. We didn't mean to give you a hard time up here. We actually had the shortest hearing in history, like seven minutes. I think so. Alex, 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 Alex